first up, as I said, is Megan Coupeau. So, Rose of BFA and dance from Juilliard. Juilliard School has dance. I have no idea. Freelance, ba freelance ballet instructor, Anna Gardner, certified sommelier. Ooh, I didn't know that. In addition, she's co founder of Neuronautic Institute Presents and Press. And that's also Matthew Hubert who's here today. A collection of 24 collaborations written. Oh, no, that's, that's a Bob Heyman. That's Bob Heyman. I skipped over to Bob Heyman. Right? Oh, yeah. Neuronautic Press, which you can find out another time, hosts uh, monthly poetry readings at New York City's KGB Red Room and does it you know, online, you know, virtually right at the moment. Megan's work can be found in Donna Mantenon, which we all know and love, and Polarity, which we all know and love. Please welcome Megan Gruposa. Great, thank you so much, George, and thank you to Great Weather. I'm so honored to be in this. You showed it, I'm showing it again. Gorgeous anthology with all of these very, very fine artists. I'm gonna start with my poem from the book. Sylvia Plath has exquisite feet, and they aren't even hers. She has a foot that will bend with my hand. I want to take her foot in both hands. Fingers pressed into the sole, thumbs across the top. What an arch. I don't believe in arches. Like any 200 plus count of primely placed, shock absorbing bone structure, they're fact. My thumb's still on top careful to not place pressure upon tendons, that would hurt. Why hurt more when attention can allow for less? I look at her feet, up to her knees and thighs, a book prop, her hair, a side cheek fall, her voice part my grandmother, part me when a little nervous or mad, and then again, her feet. I reach my hands at the cuff of her trousers, her pedal pushers, calves cupped one in each palm, my thumbs pressed just below the outside of her knees. And with even pressure and non-confrontational eye contact, my thumbs slowly descend to ankles and repeat and repeat until she sighs all the heavy away. They're not her feet. It's not even her. It's never her. My hands are so empty of her feet. And I'm gonna move on to some more I guess more love poems of a sort. You are an infinite door. There is nothing like you and nothing that rhymes with you, except maybe the sun, but that's a lie. It's cashew. There is nothing like you and nothing that rhymes with you, only the moon, the effervescent moon. You're always there, even when unseen. Multitudes achieve balance, resisting your pull and like it. When you make me bleed, it's not actually your fault. I was bleeding anyway. There is nothing like you, but everything resonates within you. You are the root, the base on one, evolved three, four time. Originality is a sham. Doors fly open and sunlight uncovers a garden. Light defines acacia leaves. They close fingertip to fingertip only when fingertips brush them. This level of delicacy is important. Acacia also comes as fiber pills. This is important as well. There is nothing that rhymes with you except maybe fountain. I'm your orographic cloud, non-existent without you, completely reliant on your lift, but also 
completely made of water, relieved to cover your head as rain, flood your sink with heat, so much heat, smoothing you with perpetual motion. Let me make you an oasis. Hollyhock, three feet tall. Three kinds of butterflies, no fights. Lead-edged wing dragonfly swoop, devour any who want blood. Soft mulch rots, children remember, they follow through, we don't call it rot. We all follow through. Hollyhock, four feet tall. Clematis and always bloom. Armies of ants fuck themselves without being told, give up farming aphids forever. Spider webs, eight feet wide. We drink dew and nap. The spiders too. Hollyhock, five feet tall. Moonflowers on the vine, our faces deep in flower, flower, fuchsia, glow basil blossoms, violets, snapdragons, orange, pink, black velvet nasturtiums, just water lilies on land, not just. They mean everything to landlocked mermaids. We all remember we're loved, gently holding each other's feet as we sleep. Last one, we want for nothing. Late at night, early in the morning, any time of day, you want my inner seam, the part that hugs a horse, opens a butterfly. You want my spiraling outwards rotation to rotate out to you, then spring back tight. You want inner ankle bone sky kissed, inner artery delicacy pressed hard against your protected parts, welcoming a projected part. My arms have inner seams, my heart, the heart of inner seam. Your tip strays far from your body, gravity pull down thighs, so much envy. Touch me here. Knock off thorns. Tell me how sorry you are. The world has spawned thorns from my skin. Rub me down. Work out worry with tender. We have such eyes inside. Satellite currents, rushing high vaulted curves. Know me. This lumbar arch says, I love you. This flutter says, I know. Bound and rebound and caught taut. How is it that every planet and every star exists within us? Thank you. Right. One more time for Megan Guapasso. Good job, Megan. Yeah, from uptown New York, we're gonna head, uh, head a little bit west, no, a little bit east of Montauk Point, namely Liverpool. I don't know if Karen Hodges is in Liverpool today. He's originally a uh, product of Ireland, but um, many years he's been in uh, Liverpool. Like many uh, Irish transplants to, to Ireland, uh, from Ireland to Liverpool over uh, the past 150 years or so. Here's his bio. Multi award winning spoken word poet, author of the Rubbery Book Prize shortlisted collection, Cosmo Cartography. He's born in, and I looked it up, Drogheda, Ireland. I don't know where it was, so I didn't have time to look it up. About. Maybe you could tell us. Based in Liverpool, his work has been published in journals and anthologies, performed at leading venues, events, and festivals across the US, the UK, and Ireland. Named one of the region's most exciting spoken word performers by the newspaper, I think it is, The Independent. Kieran was named a highlight of Guy Garvey's Meltdown Festival 
at the South Bank Center, London, and a powerhouse poet at the top of his game by Lingo Festival, Dublin. And, uh, just to add to that, um, he has work forthcoming in Fence, Rhino Poetry, Prelude, Crab Creek Review, Juked, Hobart, Ruminate, Fourth River, and I don't want to take any more of his eight minutes, so please just welcome Kieran Hodgers. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. I always uh, feel sorry for people having to read out my bio. There's so many confusing things. <laughs> um, and thank you so much to Great Weather for Media. It's a real honour to be included in your pages. I remember meeting Jane and some of the Great Weather for Media team in Manchester many a moon ago, and it's really wonderful to be here tonight. I'm going to start off with the poem in the collection. Um, it's titled Cicatrix, which is a scar or mark left on the body from a healed injury. Cut me and I'll make language. See the etching stride with a soldier's conviction and bandage just the same. Once more unto meaning, dear friends, once more an urged narration of the knife deepening after it was removed. How the poem sits like a faulty bomb waiting to blow. I've heard it is the oldest magic, that the first, wo the first word was a wound and every story is a scar. We began by carving. Though the axes come to us now, called home by napkins waved to shore, we welcome their weary necks, drooling silver-edged tongues to nestle in our ribs like a broken winged bird, a stitch, a diaspora, offering their stifled strength to be melted into coins, candlesticks, promises. We suckle the splinters from their sex, tracing the swollen palpitations of our bark-carved hearts. A ring to mark the marriage of each year unfolds our bodies into lined pages. Speaking from where meaning was notched from us to begin with, we peer over into the rift, hoping that when wisdom grabs our ankles, it will lift. Um, this next poem is called Soundtracking, and it's just inspired by walking through my local park with a particular album in my ears and sometimes those two things collide and a poem comes out. The sky is grey paper, scratch marked with muddy stones picked from the bottom of my shoe. September branches reach like witches' hands, pinching the clouds to burst. Dotted moss green and wet brown, it's a frog of a day. Even the seagulls surrender and more in momentary lakes, moulded into dips in the field. It rained like a trickle of mist at first. Then, fat slurps even the canopy couldn't keep from falling off its chin. If today were an album, it would be one that told a story. Songs long as landscapes soundtrack the darkening of days. Lyrics, the calligraphy of clouds. A melody that holds you in the car after parking. The music a sunrise and the dark outside could harm you. My forearms stick to the cheap waterproof jacket. Porous as Sunday afternoon is to evening, as solstice is to equinox, as belonging is to place. Yet we return like the past is just something we do, waiting for the future to arrive. I've been writing a lot about trees, <laughs> literally trees, uh, and it's slowly starting to unfurl into other types of natural phenomena, but this one is a bit of a hybrid between trees and the ocean. It's called surfacing. When she told me how you went, I heard a twig snap beneath my foot, like the sound of it was your name now, and I was summoning you to surface from a sea of trees. I saw you not as softly spoken as I thought you to be, just drowned out muffled by a mind too heavy to float. When the air bubbles popped, the wreckage that had been praying to become treasure became testimony instead. To salvage is past tense, happens after the fact, the crash, the sinking. And by then the shimmer of drowning showed you something different when you looked up. The lips of waves beyond the branches, an oar, a doorway, the moon, an exit sign above. A reversed rising, they'd already let you down, 
by the time you decided to climb. I'm going to finish on this poem, which hopefully is a little bit more uplifting than some of the ones that have gone before. And it's titled Phalacon, which is the Irish word for butterfly, which when you translate it literally just means a flying party. Fela is the Irish for celebration or party. And a con just means like flying creature or flying thing. And I thought that was an excellent etymology. Um, and I'd been thinking a lot about some of the stuff that's in the poem and it just made sense putting them together. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm looking forward to listening to everyone else as well. Do you ever feel like your soul is having an off day? Like it's called in sick? Like you're moving in retrograde? Like your conscious mind is trying to stave off the vertigo it feels when it peeks into the depths of your subconscious? I'm wondering what this feeling is. Why I'm suspicious of it and what might happen if I could trust it. Take the caterpillar, for instance. They're basically driven by this senseless need to eat like they're preparing for something without really knowing they're preparing for anything at all. And then when they've had their fill, this hormonal instinct kicks in and they suddenly wiggle off ready for adventure, lacking any kind of map or any idea that they're even traveling. They just feel that they're moving. How many of us feel ourselves moving but go nowhere? Are we not moving in the right way, with the right intention? And why does this feeling niggle inside us like a caterpillar who's had its fill, but can't go anywhere and doesn't understand why, but that not being able to go anywhere makes them feel like less of a caterpillar and just a common worm. I don't think we make very good caterpillars, but we do get lost in ourselves just the same. Falling through the gaps between days of a calendar, swimming in lists, buried in circumstance, understudying our own lives. Maybe we're craving some kind of hibernation from momentum, some suspension in time, a roving through the psychic debris of our lives. Do we just need the plates to stop spinning and fall for us to recollect a better shape of ourselves from the broken shards, shattered like a universe across the floor? Have you ever felt like this? Have you ever felt like you needed to? I used to think butterflies were fragile because they break so easily, but I'm learning that they are the caterpillar, returned from annihilation, iridescent in new expression. They glimmer and guide a way through. They speak beyond their limits to herald from the other side that death is just the middle of the story. They know that those who start their migrations die before the end, that a new generation follows to complete it. Sustained on the sweat sipped from resilience, they learn that what needs to happen will, that they can either let go or be dragged. Yet, in the cracked chrysalis of our conviction, we shun the light we've let in, shining where we've been hiding, a recovery reversed, a perversion of place. What if we used fear as a compass instead? Let it lead us to where we glitter instead of rot, gild instead of cut, to where we can look back and realize that what we managed in the meantime might be found in a fossil in years to come and they will marvel at our color. Maybe we should learn to let go, let that foolish instinct take us around the bend. Maybe we're going the same way after all. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy the rest of your night. All right. All right, Karen, thank you. Chrysalis, crack chrysalis of our conviction. We go from uh, butterflies in Liverpool and hollyhocks uptown. We're gonna find out what kind of flora and fauna they got in Brooklyn next. This is from uh, uh, Karen Newberg. Willister is a New York City poet. And of course, Brooklyn is part of New York City, but Brooklyn is its own distinct thing, as we all know. But Karen Newberg, Brooklyn-based poet, our latest book. Who else is in the house? Brooklyn in the house. Wave. Wave. There we go. All right. A lot of Brooklyn in the house. Her latest book is Pursuit. That's Kelsey Price. Last year, she's a author of three chapbooks, including Elephants Are Asking, 
I remember that well, Glass Liar, 2017. Poems and collages can be found in 805, New Verse News, Verse Daily, among others. Karen Newberg is associate editor of the online poetry journal, First Literary Review East. That's Cindy Hockman, so you're the best. So your cohort there. Please welcome Karen Newberg. Hi, everyone, and thank you, George. And I'm really honored, uh, incredibly honored to be in the anthology. Thank you, all the editors of Great Weather for Media. I'm going to start um, with a few newer poems, newer for me since the publication of Pursuit. And I'm going to end with the poem that's in the anthology. This first poem is called Red Riding Hood. She said the forest was a friend. She said she knew the trees by name. She said the basket was not too heavy. She said she was excited to see her grandmother. She said she knew the way. She said she would not talk to strangers. I did not remember to mention the wolf. I did not remember to talk about disguises. I did not remember to tell her about the teeth or the way flesh gives way before the heart. I did not hesitate to let her go. And later when she told me, I did not blame her. This poem is called After. Thank you. After. On heading out, I was only interested in a next I couldn't envision but wanted. There was a fog I had to pass through, a wall with pictographs I couldn't decipher, a darkness I avoided. A book caught me in the rye. I didn't turn down any corner. When I couldn't undo my lengthening tether, I tore it in two. My half trailed almost to the ground. Later, I used it to make a lariat to catch what was left of what I had left. Drag it all back. A girl I barely knew came with it. All my shoes are dancing shoes. All my shadows lead home. Elongated as if being pulled, my shadow merges into the shadow of the tree leaning in the direction of my destination as sun behind keeps lowering until our single shadow is swallowed into dark's glow. And then my swift red shoes, my red dancing shoes, dance across the distance to my home, its door ajar, supper on the table, and there waiting, the one who always smiles on my return. I'm calling this poem Summer Light, but I'm thinking it could also be called Family Life. I dream of the light in our summer rooms and the way the rooms called us to their cupped palms, light emanating into a quiet that kept me wanting. I dreamed I knew then words that could have taken us into things as I wished them, but I couldn't even envision what that was. I didn't have the words only an abundance of summer light gently enveloping us, so together, yet so separate, so private. And I'm not sure that um, this poem, which is the last of the new poems, and then I'll read the one from the anthology. I'm not sure that it's done yet, but I wanted to try it out. So it's called Eco Poem. The desire to say something is losing to the description of the desire to say something, is losing to the impatience of wanting said, the inclusion of all around, a kind of summary of an everything happening and also not happening, a push-pull, a two-person saw cutting through a 2,000-plus-year-old tree, the last of its kind in what had been a forest across, take your pick where. Animals without natural habitats, learning to forage our trash for food, or starving on a flow shrinking in size. In exchange, what they transmit turns to epidemic, to pandemic. The slide we're in as the destruction of Earth's resources expands, 
sliding as if no one who has the power to stop it is watching. See how well we humans have learned to work together, not, not even for our own saving. Oh, the children know, and they know who's allowing it. Look in the mirror, there, there's that person, times billions. And um, I'm sorry, I have, okay. Um, I just omitted a poem. Okay, so here's the final poem, which is from the wonderful anthology. I'm holding it up again. I, I really encourage everyone who doesn't already have a copy to get a copy. It's just wonderful. Um, the title from the poem is also the first line of the poem and the title comes from combining lines by Edward Hirsch and Pope Gregory I. I wasn't going to lay down on my side and face away from the fetid smoke coming out of the liar's mouth. But here in the park, amid vendors selling resist buttons, all was a mellow, tranquil. Graduates in purple gowns, everyone enjoying the first sunny day in a week, a shirtless young man displaying a pleasant torso. I swear I got it. The simple pleasure of doing nothing, the benefit of sitting back and relaxing, even while hoping it's not going to be too late to do something after. Thank you. All right, nice, really good. Thank you, Karen Newberg. Polar, Polar Bear Cub Club from Brooklyn. Next up, um, I'm not sure what borough Roberto Mendoza Ayala is from, but he's um, our next uh, featured reader from the collection. Roberto Mendoza Ayala writes poetry both in English and Spanish. 2016, he started Dark Light Publishing, a company based in New York specializing in bilingual editions of poetry books for American and Latin American authors. Born in Mexico, has been a resident of New York City since 2012. Roberto has published poetry collections, Las Otras Estaciones, Negra Luz, and uh, Ultra Sonidos, and one book of short stories, Cerquita de Dios. In 2015, he coordinated the bilingual anthology from New York I think, is it, is it Nueva, Nueva York to New York? Or it says any Z? Nesa York. Which is it, Robert, Roberta? Nesa York to New York. From Nesa York to New York. So it wasn't a typo. Good. Oh. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Welcome, Roberto. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank Great Weather for Media for inviting me to read and for publishing my poem in their 2020 anthology, Escape Wheel, which reunites the work of more than 60 writers from all over the world. It's amazing to be part of this. Thank you, George, Thomas, David, Jane, and Mary. The first poem that I'm going to read is called Rings. That's the one that was selected for this anthology. This poem intends to reflect about circularity Life is immersed in a series of concentric rings, and I wanted to play some well-known images of circles and write some lines around them. The poem begins and ends with the letter O, which in ancient times was represented by an eye. Rings. On the other, on the other side of this O, a tiger awaits your commands. It's the pond in the deer's eye, the torch that opens the night of the cyclops, a blazing vulture circling over the living, the crown of light of the eclipse's kingdom. I burn the field around me to stop your fire, but the greater the diameter of my desire, the more inside you stay. The wave of Hokusai swallows the boats at last, sinks them, turns them over, leaves them again where they are. Hear the drain, for all of these 
useless ink of. The next poem I'm going to read is called Thank you, Red Fish at Sunset. In this poem, I try three intersections between the color red and the sky, color red and the sea, and the color red and a river. Red fish at sunset. First, red sky. One last trot emerges from a strip in the vault, a long cloud going through the city like a red flag, a colorful slit in the sky about to open and pour its hues and set fire to the scales of buildings. Iridescent silver fishes briefly gasping for air before plunging abysmal into the phosphorescent night of stars. Second, Red Sea. A red thought runs through me. Now that I found you at the sunset of a memory, standing on a trampoline, about to jump in the abyss where the gleam of your figure head will faintly illuminate the depths of rubble, the piled up shipwrecks and our abandoned vessel today guarded by blind fish. Third, Red River. A toast for you, this red memory of the sun-born faces, which also colors the hats, the fishing roads, and the crystals of our bottled conversations, six ounces each, containing this boat, the catch of the day, and the river of light where we continue sailing on a scarlet sunset. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. In 2016 was published, you mentioned this, uh, George, a bilingual anthology called From Nessa, York to New York, which compiled the work of 25 poets, 12 poets from the United States, mainly from New York City, and 13 from Mexico. It was an extraordinary experience for everyone involved. I want to read one of the, my poems included in that anthology. It's called Prison of Bones. And it's about a dog who is a poet at the same time. Prison of Bones. A dog is a poet caged in a prison of bones. He sniffs the night and is driven mad until deafness comes for what he hears and no one else does. He harasses women with plaintive howls and then he languidly licks his predictable wounds, the natural consequence of so much howling, so much pity and so much badgering. However, when he murmurs into the ears of night his unhearable ultrasonic song, into his eyes, phosphorus, two grateful worlds. They also throw and they heart the air, rabbit verses as ferocious bites, tearing the other. The poet chases his ass before bedtime, and he's frightened by the shadows of his black and white dreams. His nose distinguishes words by the smell of ink. As hungry as lucky, he always finds among them a meaty metaphor to swallow in peace. <clears throat> Thank you. Finally, this last poem was written in the heat of dis the discussions about building a wall between Mexico and the United States. Have you ever heard of the walls, the Great Chinese Wall, the Berlin Wall, etc.? Well, it seems soon we'll have another 
one in the, loose, in the list of useless walls. This is called the flow. I'm not so sure your wall will be useful. Wall Street Falls, Niagara Falls, Berlin Wall Falls, any wall falls, water flows. Please forgive the flows. We've been so fast and furious, irresponsible, so violent. We have a lot of songs and of guns, a migratory flow of weapons. Don't know exactly what's your flow. Be safe, be great, home made. Oh, I see, we've abused the flow of trade. And you need a flow of, of excuses to win. You warn your flock, as a good tell evangelist would do, of those strange signs in the subway, non-Christians speaking in tongues, kids marrying African, Asian, or worse, a flow of exotic vows. It will take only one tenth of the budget for that wall to build many walls on the grounds of your backyard. Some pretty schools, a few factories to stop the flow. But your show wouldn't flow so. Thank you very much. All right. Roberto Mendoza Ayala, thank you so much. Great to have you in the house. Take a stretch, we're halfway through the program. We're gonna take a big fly and leap across the Mississippi River to the left coast, where the remainder, well, New Mexico is kind of left coast. The remainder of our readers are for today. New Mexico, you know, it's kind of dry, but it's got some coast, I think. It's got Rio Grande River, yeah, I think, which leads to the coast. So for our, for our final four readers, I'll introduce first, from uh, Southern California. Where is she? Okay, good, we have her here in the house. Jan Sham Shackleton. Hey, how you doing, Jan? To, um, I will have, give you a word or two about her. She's actually a Hong Kong writer living in Los Angeles. She's a columnist for the Hong Kong Free Press. Man, you must have a lot to write about these days. Her work is also been featured in the Chicago Quarterly Review, Pop Matters, Litro, among others. She's currently seeking an agent. I can't help you. <laughs> for, <laughs> for her coming of age novel, Island of Lights, set during the 1997 regime change of Hong Kong. It was really a pleasure to choose uh, her poem for uh, this anthology. And uh, uh, I miss Hong Kong very much, personal basis. So let's hear it for Yan Sham Shackleton. Hello. Um, I'm going to read a piece that was in the anthology. Please buy it. Um, so uh, this is about the Hong Kong resistance that's going on now. So I wrote this a while back, um, the political situations changed, but this was written about what is happening. Um, and it is part of a bigger piece. Um, a pool of congealed blood, now hard and cracking, had dried on my kitchen floor for two days. As the sponge in my hands made contact, the foam turned pink and the bloody liquid spread. Why didn't I wear gloves? Water watch TV in the living room. She'd woken up from her nap because of a nightmare. Neither of us had slept much since the police dragged her father away with blood streaming out of his mouth. I heard the sound of someone pounding at the door shouting, what is going on? Shit, why was my husband home early? I washed my hands quickly. When I opened the door, he stood there, suitcase by his side, looking at me suspiciously. What the fuck happened to the door, he asked. Why is it different? Not wanting to tell him the police broke it down, I remained silent as he looked around our home. 
Who is this child in the living room? He asked carefully. In front of us sat a four-year-old girl by a giant dollhouse and a wide assortment of toys I had brought in the hope they would distract her from having been left with me. It's water, I said, not knowing if James would remember who she was. Eason's daughter, James asked. I saw a worried recognition cross his face. Yes, I replied, averting his gaze. James switched to a sharp seriousness. Where is Eason? In jail? I sighed. James would find out the truth whether I lied to him or not. When is he coming out? I don't know. You don't know when he's coming out of jail? James repeated. If James's pupils could glow red with anger, I knew they would. No one knows how long anyone's going to spend in jail these days. Before he could reply, a piercing scream came from the living room. Baba, Baba, Baba. We both turned and in front of us stood water, reaching towards the television with a nearly life-sized image of her father. As the leader of a separatist movement that threatens the peace and prosperity of our great motherland, Eason's voice droned from all sides on the surround sound speakers. I see my mistake now as being misguided and influenced by the hands of foreign governments. I gasped. This wasn't the Eason I knew. Flaking skin covered his downturned mouth, his eyes unfocused as if he could only see inside his head and no further. They must have tortured him to get this false confession. Water continued to scream. Tears and snot streamed down her face. Her mouth twisted, showing the gap from her missing baby teeth. Baba, 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 fan lay, po po. Stomping on the ground, she shouted for her father. When she realized Eason couldn't be reached, her little fingers touched a hard screen instead of her dad. Water kicked over her dollhouse, and all the furniture and dolls came crashing down, sliding underneath the real furniture. Shit, James said as I ran towards her. I w water, lo water launched herself on the floor. I tried to pick her up. She turned around and kicked me in my face. Fuck, I swore, stepping backwards. James, finding the remote, paused the image. Water, seeing her father frozen, stopped moving. I ran to her again and held her as she cried. James threw me another angry look. I knew he thought me responsible. If I didn't bring this little girl in the house, none of this would be happening. I wanted to shout back to him, this is not me, blame the Chinese government if they only left Hong Kong alone. She can't stay here, he said, eyes boring down at me. She has no one else, I shouted over waters crying. The police broke down our door, he hissed. I got it fixed. What's stopping from them from coming again? To come after a four-year-old? To come after you, he snapped not wanting to believe that was possible, but also knowing it was. A few quiet tears ran down my cheeks. James turned his back from me and took a deep breath and walked away. After a while, Water began playing with her toys again. She appeared content, which seemed strange to me, but maybe little children did that. They cried and then they played. I had seen her do that multiple times in the last two days. I heard James turn on the shower. My mind raced. What would I do? What would happen to her? James could simply refuse to keep her, and then I would have to find, hand her over to strangers. Tears kept streaming down my face until it occurred to me I would leave James. I love my husband, I couldn't, but I couldn't leave a child behind. I owed it to Eason. I owed it to the resistance. Unless the police took me, I wouldn't give her up. The showers stopped and the sun set and the room darkened. It didn't seem to bother water, so I did nothing. Then a click, the light of the living room went on. With everything illuminated, I wondered how I would feel to move out of our modernist home, which I decorated so carefully. James, still avoiding look at me, James walked towards water. He stood for a moment over her and seemed to be inspecting the toys. He bent over and picked up a horse with a silver mane. I swallowed. 
He was cleaning up already, not liking the mess in our previously childless home. He was preparing to rid of her right there and then. I knew he could be cold and logical, but I hadn't realized he was heartless. Then he sat down in front of Water, who stared at him. Hello, he said. She didn't respond, but watched him unsure. James squared his shoulders and looked lost. He glanced at me, but before I could catch his eye or say anything, he began to move the horse up and down, making it sprint in place. He concentrated on the toy as if trying to figure out how to play. It's a horse, James said softly, brows knotted, then carried on moving it up and down. Water stared at him, afraid and curious. James simply continued repeating, this is a horse. Then he smiled at her and reacting to that, Water said, horse, thoughtfully. She picked up the black horse with the brown rein with her little fingers. She followed his example and moved her toy up and down as well. Then I watched my husband and Water gallop their horses side by side. Thank you. Let's hear it for Jan Shab Sackleton. That's her four page prose piece, Gallop from uh, Escape Wheel. And a beautiful piece it is. Thank you, Jan. And now turn to uh, a guy who, uh, I mean, he's known, well known in uh, LA because of many associations, including Beyond Baroque. But last time I saw him was at, it was Howell Gallery. He was uh, at the Howell Gallery. We had a nice reading there as well. Um, just around the corner from uh, from uh, the Bowery Poetry Club. So, so man, you see a lot of different places. Richard Modiano, Richard Modiano. Richard, um, as he says in his bio, has become active in the literary community, connecting to the poetry project while living in New York City. That was a number of years ago. He became known to Gregory Corso, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Ted Berrigan, between 2010 to 2019, he served as an executive director at Beyond Baroque in Venice Beach, uh, which I think we all know. At that time, he produced and curated hundreds of literary events, his devotion to poetry, literature, relaunched Beyond Baroque, and this is true, for a new generation of writers and artists. He is, and I did not know this, a wobbly, a rank and file member of the industrial workers of the world. That's saying it's so. In 2019, he was elected vice president of the California State Poetry Society. Mover and shaker Richard Modiano, please welcome him. Well, thank you, George. Um, and good. Richard, can you un unmute yourself? Oh, there yes, you. I'll just do it. Okay, I think it, it should stay unmuted now. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, thanks, George and uh, Jane. And it, when I was uh, director of Beyond Baroque, it was my great pleasure to host readings of this anthology there over the years. And uh, now I, I end up being in one. So uh, I. I'm, I'm profoundly grateful for that and I am honored. I'm going to read my poem that is published in this terrific anthology that, uh, and you can, with an anthology, you really know uh, what goes into it. I mean, you, you, you have a group of editors who are putting this anthology together. And when it comes out the way this one did, you know that these editors are artists as well as editors and they understand a range of work. So. Um, it, it is a terrific anthology. So my poem that is in there is called Go Underground. After the defeat of the Paris Commune, Artie Rimbaud, the 17-year-old poet protagonist, said the blood of its victims drained away all hope for his generation. For a long time to come, Rimbaud said, truth will have to go underground. It had been reduced to tatters along with life. Once again, truth has similarly been reduced to tatters along with life. 
To trace out any hope of its recovery, poets need to organize underground, follow old mole of old, agitate underground, assemble in low rent storefronts, in sunken basements, maybe in communal squats, somewhere cheap, somewhere far away, or perhaps close by. Begin again, build up again. Today, truth, today is more truthful in the underground than in the commercial overground or in the nonprofit overground. Truth will not be voiced from the rich core, but from the honest poor periphery, from the margins of life, from the margins of our city, from its grungy peripheral banilus, from broken down informal zones de defendra, defended to the end. There, nothing will be truer than nothingness, the source of a new radical beginning. And since I'm reading in Los Angeles, I have a, a Los Angeles poem. Um, it's called A Word, and it is a poem for my friend, the poet Iris Berry. You have to select a word. It will be talked about as little as possible and have a deep suggestiveness like nature, bloom from within itself and at the edge of the fate encircling you. It will become darkly and sweetly ripened. Of a hundred experiences, it is, all, it, it is always, it always will be the one sum total. One teardrop becomes the ocean of all teardrops. A single point of red neon on Hollywood Boulevard on a dark evening is the light of the whole world. And after that, and after that, your poem, like a substance entirely fresh, released far away from your memory, the same as a chord plucked from a Stratocaster, the same as haze over the San Fernando Valley in spring, will suddenly begin to sing from its own recollection. And finally, um, comrade. I like to read and write in coffee shops, old habit escaped from noisy lodgings of bygone days. I share the place with the gentrified locals, fixated on glowing screens if alone, yakking about what's cool if with others, talking about dreams of screenplays and auditions with the eagerness of youthful promise. They pay me no mind, the old fellow in threadbare clothes scribbling in a pocket notebook with a fountain pen. The young barista, pierced, braided, tattooed, took the money and handed me a coffee as we made the exchange. I said, surely, thanks, comrade. Leaning in and glancing from side to side conspiratorially, the barista whispered back, how did you know I was a communist? Thank you. Thank you, Richard Rodiano. I was busy looking at the map of New Mexico to find out where our next guest was born. He was born in Mora. It's on the Mora River. It's a little bit to the north of uh, a little bit to the north of uh, of, 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 of Taos, New Mexico. If you head towards if you had south, uh, southeast from uh, Taos, New Mexico, was born there. It's a tiny little place. But, um, you know, uh, he's still a New Mexico guy, though. He did some time in Durham University and, uh, in England as well. Nathan V. Baker. His work has appeared as forthcoming in Rhino, Fence, Poetry, Prelude, Crab Creek Review, Juke, Hawk, Ho Hobart, Ruminate, the Fourth River, J Journal, Black Renaissance Noir, The Roanoke Review, High Desert Journal, Missing Slate, other publications. He, uh, uh, this small town, mountain town, mountain town of Mora, it's got that river running through it. A master's program for creative writing at Durham University, Durham University in the United Kingdom. So where are you coming to us from today, Nathan? I'm actually here in New Mexico. Okay. Um, first, Take I'd like to thank, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. Um, you're wonderful. Um, thank you, George. Thank you, Jane. Um, thank you, Thomas, as well. Um, you guys put out incredible work, incredible content. Um, Escape Wheel is amazing. I read it um, cover to cover um, in a single sitting. So it's, it's a real honor to be here um, with you all today. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Admissions. Um, it's originally published in uh, Hobart or Hobart Pulp, depending on how you refer to it. Um, 
I've always been irreverent at exactly the smallest times. They call it an unkindness of ravens or a conspiracy, a conspiracy of ravens. Drinking after a hangover is tedious, maintenance drinking between bouts of nausea and the subtext headaches. The hangover is a week old and I'm nursing it at a funeral. It's called a venue of vultures. When I was young, I didn't know that. I can remember the first time I admitted to myself that it is quite hard to be a good man and mean it, but that no one really quits the ape anyways. A wake of buzzards sounds somber but dignified, and I wonder every time I throw a bottle away if I failed the world by never recycling. He was a good man, we say. I never knew anything was wrong, did you? He was a brave man, we say. You know, he didn't advertise his pain. Okay, um, the second one is um, called Gentrification. Um, originally, it's uh, published in the NYU's Black Renaissance Noir, um, a magazine which I really love. Um, there's this fucking dude in Chicago. On the weekend mornings, his body had rails. His bones gleamed right through the sky. Looked also like he had somehow managed to fit stilts on the bottoms of his sockless feet and pull his shoes up over the whole of the stilts, misappropriating the vertical space in a feat of chimerical brilliance. Fucking guys, something really. Whole world hidden, the River Thames, the bridges of London, the Empire State, between where the black man's heel and insole meet. There's this fucking dude in Chicago. On weekend mornings, he trundles, and his shopping cart trundles too. He pulls up to garage sales and steps politely 10 feet away slangs his shit that no one wants on the dope corners, tangible merchandise, until he's asked to leave, and he's always asked to leave. You can find him in the evening with a highlighter and a newspaper, squatting in the alleyways with his pants down around his jaws. Fucking guy's something, really. Face forested by a white Brillo bearding. Knows all the fucking cops, and they buy him coffee. And the cops clean his ears with those Chinese wax removers while he cocks his head and listens to the flame. The weather's hard with the lake effect, and the cops lick castor oil into his chiblins for it. There's this fucking dude in Chicago. On weekend mornings, he's got his gleanings and wears string medallions. On one string, got a handset of an old phone. Got a cowbell, I'm um, sorry, got a cowbell. Got a cardboard sign that says Black Chicago. He's even managed to get the writ notarized, but it cost him most his teeth. Fucking guy's something, really. He's got a rooster that'll perch on his hand, Cock rides the shopping cart handle with a firm grip and preaches the word to dope heads on Wednesdays at noon for a small taste and eats the lice out of the fucking dude's hog bristle beard. Lays an egg in the dude's mouth every morning too. There's this fucking dude in Chicago. On weekend mornings, the bars don't open until he raps at the wood of the portals. Patrons all supplicants as he cracks and coughs and bleeds glitter into the slat perforations of the keg cellars, drinking nothing but well rum for the islandry of it. Fucking guy something, really. Got two different colors of eyes, dark brown and light brown. Eighth son of an eighth son, designated after the portion of the corner of a twist rendered sandwich baggie. Ziploc, man, always Ziploc. There's this fucking dude in Chicago, on weekend mornings, wearing strings and signs with small writ, saying, you own equity, not people, because nouns is a liability. You can find him outside of houses who are having garage sales, Fucking guy something, really, until he's asked to leave. Amputating a single inch off his stilts every time until he is short enough to beg and tall enough to be realized, dismissed. The prophet finally emblazoned on a coffee cup painted by Thomas fucking Kincaid. Lodged into a box and regifted in concept. Okay, um... This next one is called Moths. Um, it's a short one. Um, this is originally from, um, out of uh, Prelude magazine. Um, pretty abstract. Edison built light in a basement and called the glass housing a globe. Even Tom knew there are still questions better left unmasked. Will a ring by diffusion atrophy a pointer finger? There's the rusty shards I wiped on my jeans behind a gas station in Montana. We could rebuild it, I said, and kicked at the concentrics, rutted in the dirt, it's a vile thing, but I like the story and the pregnant patina of the orangish hood and the price. Could you learn to enjoy the small calcification in your boot? Using a pebble as a stilt, the moon in the high cupboard has gotten into my skin like fish oil. 
Can a tiny look underneath something actually sear you? When I was young, I knelt down and peeked into a small hole. There were piles of mice, silver tufts, and pinkly desiccated ears, like mold sprouting from feminine diamonds. Poisoned mice by the generations, and still we had a pantry that was necessary. In the dark, you could hear the grammar of them, the swish and delight in the wonderfully cold house with closets full of Wisconsin blankets on rotation. We never had any moths. The mice ate them. And um, last but not least, um, this is from Escape Wheel. Um, I really like this uh, poem. It's called Ars Morandi, right? As we know, which um, uh, from Latin means the art of dying. Okay. Is cancer? No, strike that. Is kindness in my throat? Is that what catches in me? Like a saturated spring season? Like a wet country in Nebraska, spotted by soon stagnant water? Equating a bump? No, a bumper growth of wild grasses, especially green and thick in the Adam's apple? No, I mean troughs. Folds now sated with an abundance of shoots and prickling lawns, yawning, wilting in my breath. No, not my breath, in the wind. This moisture equating AIDS mosquitoes a buzz and American coots and big brown bats ripe with gold brown fur and passerforms, the overlapping vermilions and yellows, the flit of wings almost like a pulse, a calendar image, cone flowers splayed and violated by fat clots of eastern bumblebees and in industry of jazz, equating mice, beavers, red foxes, gyro falcons, equating what? Populations overdrive? Growth of economy? No. All because of a little rain? What a romantic soul would call a cloud full of stress released? No, misappropriated beauty or fond melancholy. That old who come that really means no more room for waifs, all guts, all fats, fawns and deer shredded to exposed vertebrae and ribs, the pinkened teeth of bears and wolves, now sponsors feeding coyotes. The circle of life, eh? Hakuna Matata? The convergence? No, the collision of all organisms. Looking from and oh, what a didactic triteness. No, oh, what a thing above, a microscope, a satellite view that looks like solar motion, an atom, an eddy, a mountain in utero, that whole cliche, no cinch. Then it really does look like kindness, no, cancer. A picture of TV static transposed to an avian skeleton. And what is that but vacancy? Is the ability to vacate kindness. Right, really nice. Thank you, Nathan. Terrific. A lot of sunshine in New Mexico. It's coming through that window. Well, I've had beautiful seven readers who so our last readers so quickly. I'm sorry to, to bring it to a conclusion after Kathy Ann Cusimano, because uh, it's going quick. It's a nice time. Nice time. Nice to hear everybody's voice. See everybody's face. Kathy Ann announces herself as a bi-coastal poet, but that's California and Boston, so Boston, I guess that's by oh, David, don't worry about it. These two, all they ever talk about is Carl Yastrzemski, who was a Long Island boy anyway. But, uh, she is a bi coastal poet. We see her here in New York from time to time. But uh, mainly she's on the West Coast and uh, doing a lot of work there, uh, sparring for beatnik ghosts crowd. We see her there all the time. Kathy Cusimano, bi coastal poet, born and raised in Massachusetts. Living for the past 35 years in California. Her works reflected in the transcendental and beat influences that both coasts provide. Kathy Ann is author of five poetry collections, five of them, including Walking Down the Street with the Sound of Life in Her Eyes. Please welcome our eighth and final reader of the day, Kathy Ann Cusimano. Thank you, George. Um, thank you, everyone. Great weather for media. Um, it has been a wonderful time getting to know you, reading with you, and loving this latest anthology. Um, I have several of the other anthologies, and I would encourage other people to get those as well because they are really great. Um, <clears throat> so I spent about a year doing a lot of road trips, and uh, it was LA, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, New York, Massachusetts, just all over the place. Um, and I love the road. I just, I love road, you know, driving music, um, everything about it. So the one that's in um, Escape Wheel is called Road Trips, Fantasies, and Lava Flows. If words were bullets and mouths were guns, we'd be full of holes right now. 
bruised hearts and rolled souls. These are the days when joys of any kind are black op opportunities for the miserable to tame. And it's your scene versus my scene instead of our scene. And it's been this way before and it will be again. And that's no excuse for the now, for the judgmental condemnation without mercy. All eyes on the ill-wishing racist abominator, but that's not the truth either. The cartoon depicts a crowd of lovers with cameras focused on the small group of haters. Is this what you wanna see? My 60s flowers are still alive, peace sign footsteps, a flower in the end of your gun. Someone's always pointing, someone's always shooting without bullets, bringing clouds and threats of lightning when the weather is fine. I stand in front of your tank, run me over or swerve out of the way because this time I will exit with wholeness. 57, 97, it doesn't matter when. There are road trips, fantasies, and lava flows, flower language, including thorns, peach trees growing in granite cracks, sandcastles waiting to be washed to the sea. His straight shot voyage from desert to ocean, he said, I bring a little speakeasy wherever I go, and I dig that kind of language, words mixed up in a box and dumped like cereal on a Sunday morning bowl. Just add milk, just add the essence of love, true love, glorious authenticity. We'll die for it anyway, die anyway, with or without it. But my last scene will be that of a woman lying down with a jaguar, not the car, the cat. The graceful with the terrifying, both authentic in their being, without judgment, without the kind of greedy loneliness that brings words to bullets, mouths to guns. The sandcastle is still the sandcastle even when it washes to the sea. Um, so I'll do uh, another poem um, from the main content called Beat Mix. And this actually was a, a, a few sayings that I read in a beat anthology and kind of, um, I like mixing things together and seeing what comes out. Beat Mix. You said my life, you said, you said it ran out to sea, but I became a seagull instead. My mouth has been kissed on by a gray flat mirror with no reflection as moon waiting, waning before a bridge exhales woman. You said, you said my life was meant to run from yours as streams from the river. You are the ocean I won't run to. You are the bridge before me the woman waiting with no mouth, waiting for me to kiss it on. You said, you said it was how I wanted us to shed our other lives, at least when we were together. I think the moon was waning, a poet in the cold wind, walking alone with birds above the canoe, shaped moons, sounds are heard. You said I asked him to come down and examine. You said maggots dancing into the air and at my ear was the whir of wings. You said there's a photograph sitting in his wheelchair. His helper sits near him. You said it was how I wanted us born to be together with headphones in one another's ear. If only the price paid were not so great and what I wanted, wanted me. Um, it's kind of along with some of my found poetry. Um, I love overhearing conversations and um, this one actually happened, the beginning of this anyways. People can't see what they're not looking for. She saw dead people in the moon. Joan swinging on a crescent, Bobby walking the dog. A joke, non-joke alignment of planets and the smiling moon took a break from grass roses live memories from social media, interpretive shadows with meaning. She said, when you get old and blind, then the magic happens. She wanted jasmine under troop carrier clouds, dirt in a box and stage flowers. A novel based on echoes, walking superhero capes, idiosyncratic fingernails, slow lane pace cars, accordion rabbits running on treadmills, 25% capacity and mysterious novelties. People can't see what they are not looking for. The note washed and dried, a ball in the pocket of your jeans, bird nest in rain gutters, summer spread before your eyes. This is a love song, but you won't know it until verse three. 
And this last one is called It's Ending, No Beginning. I might need some blurt paper, some loose leaf three hole or no line verbal vomit catching art canvas. N's want to escape the page by turning into M's or V's, scribble over letters, pits of pools of dark lines over white spaces. It's the spaces that get to you between what's written but what is and is left unsaid. They have outlawed the hug, the handshakes, all form of comfort and introduction. White spaces where lines matter and motion spreads one disease and stasis spreads another. Volcano vomit, self-centered hailstorm, a thousand cuts of unfriending, friends scattered, unfriended, no touching stand-in pets performing miraculous psychotherapy, unpaid bills and unpaid billables, five weeks of income behind in three-month intervals, prayer rolls, prayer beads, crystals of revelation, summer heat and dry drought pools, gardening and global warming, word vomit, human honey, meteor shards and falling firework trails, brain-eating amoeba, lecturing decisions and vacations homes of our leaders. The mind sinks under sacred weight, sacred jazz, fire wrapped in fog, summits blazing in inventive departures, fiercely splendid surges of thoughtless light. If I were an enlightened being bouncing off the surface of unattachment, then maybe I would not be so affected. Midweek, midday somewhere, red birds, smooth pen over rough paper, the correcto mats break down each sentence, each fact spread wide like peanut butter over every can't clean it fast enough surface. We better get used to this thing, this beginning. There is no new normal when the revolution begins. Statues, icons, seashore and bird nests, no more dining indoors, spray hose to your spit face, black paint erasing black lives matter, new definitions of hate for hate crimes. It's beyond irony now. Ten-year-old rock bands have turned no flip like a tornado with reservations, like a stampede with tickets turned into enduring apathetic rock it's not on the cards or in the table desert sailors reading history rat pellets in bird seed bowls ambivalent afternoon breeze spreading change the new age the fire and brimstone horses of the apocalypse the answers are on the end of his thumb up or down close to a timeline the form to release notes stuff to do lists leftover tasks moved to new page new jazz words jazz thoughts a husky smoking a pipe on a whale of uncertainty, it's beginning, no ending, a comet passing our path of progressing, it's ending, no beginning, it's ending, now beginning. Thank you. Oh, man. Did I get that right? A husky smoking a pipe on a whale of uncertainty. Kathy Ann Cusimano, great ending, great conclusion to eight uh, eight people bringing us fine poetry from across the world. 